Hey, praise the Lord. We welcome anybody watching us tonight. I know a number of people said they were from all over the place when they heard about me wearing my outfit here. So uh, yeah, go big, go blue. That's right. So this is uh, this outfit I wore in the 1970s when I played at South Dakota State. I played football and I played basketball at a full ride scholarship. Uh, thankful for the opportunities that I had to play at the university. You can tell it's an old jackrabbit here, not a new jackrabbit. Uh, I like the new one better, the old one better. Okay, like this one. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, uh, there's the new one, yeah. That one looks a little meaner and tougher, I think this. But uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a fun time for my life, but I got saved, thank you, Jesus, changed my life. And uh, so I wanted to spin off of this some t tonight just as I'm talking here, uh, using this analogy and so forth. Sunday, you know, I use some statements that we hear, all right, that are real common that we hear. So let me give you a list again, I'll say. Number one, everything happens for a reason. Okay, you'll hear that quite common. Number two, God is in control, that he's in control of everything. Number three, God always has a purpose, uh, and that's uh, always out there too. Number four, God allowed it to happen. Number five, God's ways are mysterious. And all these things are talked about on Sundays, so you could always go back to the website, rehear it, or re-watch re the, the video there at the website. Number six, all things work together for good. Uh, number seven, God wants to teach you something. So these are things we talked about. Uh, these are all statements uh, that are quite common in the body of Christ. Let's call them Christianese. But the fact is that all of these statements are false. All right? They might have some truth in them, but they're a false statement, all right? And they're misleading. So the misleading part is, with all these statements, there is the assumption that there is only one spiritual force, okay? There's the assumption there's only one spiritual force, and that spiritual force is God, right? So, so, uh, so if that's the case, then everything that happens is God. And that's how it's treated, and that's how it's taught in many places and so forth, as far as uh, uh, understanding things spiritually. You're predestined, God has a plan, and all these things, this Calvinistic thinking and stuff. Uh, but biblically... It's wrong. So unless you know who your adversary is, you will never win. Now, if I go on the athletic field, if I'm playing football and I was a quarterback, if I'm playing football and I'm throwing the pass, but I'm throwing it to someone with a red jersey, yeah. I'll guarantee you my coach isn't going to be happy. He's going to say, why'd you throw it to him? Now, why would he say that? Because he's the, the, red, the person with the different colored jersey is the opponent. Right. And when you go on the field to play, any, anywhere you play in the world, people are going to have different colored jerseys. And the reason is so you can tell who you're playing against. See, if I don't know who I'm playing against, then I can give the ball to anybody. Or anybody can come and slap the ball out of my hand, and it's if we're all on the same team. Now, we know in the natural, athletically speaking, we know that, of course, you can't play that way, right? Because you could, you could score and score and score, but the, you get to the end of the game, it's like, well, who won? <laughs> Got all these points on the scoreboard, but who actually won? Amen. So unless I know who my opponent is, in other words, in other words I'm going to pass it to the person on my team, I'm going to give the ball to the person on my team. I'm going to try it with everything I can to keep it away from the guy who wants to get it, get the ball from me. Right? Isn't that right? Yeah. And I'm going to know that because we have different colors. Now, in the, in the quickness of a game, in the quickness of a game, you know, it's not like, you know, someone, someone one time, you know, people, we call them armchair quarterbacks because they got all the answers. And they're sitting in row 35, you should have did this. I always said this. I said, I've got a solution for that. I take that person from row 35. You come on down here. I stick a helmet on him, pads on him. I say, you go in one, one play, I'll guarantee you he'll never open his mouth again. One play. Because when you snap the ball and you're dropping back, all is just a mass of hitting <laughs> and noise. And everybody's coming after you with the ball. Right? 
And so, and so when you look for your receivers, you're not, like, you're not thinking, oh, that's Joe or that's Sam or something. No, you're just looking for the guy that's got your color on, and that's the guy you're going to hit. Right? You're going to throw it to the guy with your same color, your teammate. Same in basketball. You're coming down the court. My grandson's really good at this. It's like he's got eyes in the back of his head. He'll come down. He's looking this way, but he's throwing the ball over here. And if guys aren't ready, they're going to get that ball right in their nose because it's a no-look pass. And he just sees it. Now, what does he see? He sees their color, right? So he sees they're coming down to that jersey. Boom, the ball's going over there. So when you play in any sport, you have different colors on. And this just helps us to distinguish who we're fighting. You should write this down. This is something I've quoted for years that God gave me. If you don't know who your opponent is, you will never win. Never. Spiritually, if you don't know that you have an opponent, you will never win. Your life will be up and down, up and down. And many people quit going to church because they blame God for doing things that he never did. Because they didn't recognize who their opponent was. So we're living this fallen world. Romans 5, Romans 5 of course, that, that Jesus came. You've got uh, that scripture there, but it says, He demonstrates His own love toward us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Now we're saved from wrath through Jesus. We're saved from wrath. Hallelujah. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Enemies, now being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So what a, what a wonderful thing that is. Now, we go to verse 12 of Romans 5, and it just says this then, that, that sin, by one man, sin entered the world, and death came through sin. Follow? Yeah. Thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now, we have this world... Because of Adam's sin, there's spiritual death, there's physical death, and from Adam's time, all creation began to suffer. We live in a fallen world. So in this world are sickness, accidents, calamities. It's a law of thermodynamics that would say, second law of thermodynamics, it would say systems will tend, a system by itself is going to tend to disorder Evolution, evolutionists think things are getting better, which, of course, is just the opposite. If you actually know college, college uh, studies and so, it's just the opposite. Things aren't getting better, they get worse. And all that, of course, is because of Adam's sin. Entropy means that there's a gradual decline in order. So it just gets worse, worse, it degrades. It doesn't get better. All because, though, of Adam's sin. Now, Adam's sin opened the door to what? It opened the door to the enemy. So all of the things that we happen, things happening in the world, none of these things involve the hand of God. None of them. So if you look at the world today and see people try to look at the world and say, why doesn't God do this? And why is, or why is God doing that? Or why this or that? His hand isn't on any of it. None of it. Jesus came to save us from wrath. Jesus came to bring us life. Jesus came to change our lives for his glory. So we live in this New Testament. That is why Christmas story, Luke chapter 2, that the angel come and he says, I've got good news of great joy for all people. So New Testament, see, <clears throat> you look who we are. This is what he's bringing us. It's good news of great joy to all of us. That a Savior, a Savior has been born for us, and his name is Jesus Christ. So the next verses there say that when the angel said, the angel said, the heavenly hosts, say, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Now, I want to notice this word here, goodwill. God's intentions are goodwill. God's intention is to do you well. God's intention is to give you a future and a hope. Not, not something bad, it's always something good, right? That's God's intention, but there's another spiritual force at work 
that unless we read our Bibles and understand it, we're out in this world, you know, flailing around, kind of playing with one hand behind our back. The devil, and, and it's amazing how even through the Gospels, Jesus would address these things. But folks, I think a lot of people, a lot of ministers just fail to want to declare what the Bible says. <laughs> Jesus said in John chapter 8, when he says, uh, you're, you belong to your father, the devil, the des desires of your father, you will do. And he's talking to the Pharisees here. The devil's a murderer. The devil doesn't stand in the truth. Now, the truth is the word of God. Amen. The Bible says there's no truth in the devil. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, this all is from the devil, right? Yeah. What Jesus is saying, there's another opponent out here that you have to understand. This opponent is trying to come to steal what you've got. To take away from you what's been given to you. Amen. And if you understand that, then you're going to protect what God's given to you. Amen. Now, to understand this even more is that you have to be in the truth. The truth is the Word of God. Everybody watching, I would encourage you to read your Bible, especially the New Testament, because the Bible says in Corinthians, He's made us able ministers of the New Testament. Don't major your life in the Old Testament. You can learn a lot from it. Yeah, I sure can. But we're living under this covenant of Jesus Christ. That he's given us all these promises, exceeding great and precious promises, that we might be partakers of the divine nature. That we can be like him. To walk in the spirit. Amen? So if this is what he's given me, these promises right here, then I'm going to guard it. Right? Knowing that I'm, you're always in a contest, folks, day and night. You're never out of the game, so to speak. You're all, you have your Christian uniform, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation. You're always there because why? You have an adversary. So all that could be 3 o'clock in the morning, but I'm going to hold on to the promises of God. Amen? Could be, it could be a Tuesday, a Friday, a Saturday. It doesn't matter what day it is. could be in the middle of a service and you're facing a battle. You have to guard what's yours. So first of all, you have to know in the Bible what's yours, right? Amen? If the Holy Spirit gives us all these things, love, joy, peace, and all those wonderful things, just understand this, none of the bad things come from God. <laughs> Amen? See, a lie, a lie will resemble the truth. You know, that resemble the truth, like, like God can work all things together for good. Resembles the truth, but not the truth. Amen. Incidentally, we talked on Sunday, you know, the context of that. People take it totally out of context. So if you know the truth, then, the truth keeps you free. Amen. Right? See, if I, if I had the ball here, and Randon was the adversary, and he's reaching over, I'm going to do everything I can to keep his hand away from what I got. In other, words, in other words, we're not going to flirt around like, hey, nice day, isn't it, you know, and then hope I get it back, you know. No. The devil, notice what it says, he's a murderer. He's a murderer. From, that's all he does. He kills. He kills things. Kills people's lives. I'm just talking about spiritually. Kills relationships. Kills marriages. That's what the enemy does. Jesus came, of course, to give us life, right? So, so in the world, look at the world now. We have this fallen world. It's like a crime scene, right? There's a crime scene out there. And a good investigator is going to look at the crime scene to determine who is at fault, right? So if a crime has been committed and someone maybe didn't even see who did it, didn't see, I don't know who did it, I, just, I don't know who did it, but I see a person dead. They're going to come and analyze the crime scene, and they're going to look at the fingerprints on the crime scene. Dust it off, right? To determine who's responsible. See, we have to look at the Word of God in such a way to identify who our opponent is, if we're ever going to win. 
So folks, I know so many Christians, they're good intentions, they love God, but they're just like a pinball. Well, you've got to be old to know what a pinball machine is, but some of you might, boom, we bounced off of one pinball thing, boom, bounced off another pinball, and that's how life goes. And they make an assumption. Boy, this is just what God has got for me in my life. But I've got good news for you. It's good news, a great joy for all people. He's got good things for you in your life. He wants to bless your life. He wants to bless you so you can be a blessing. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your home. He wants to bless your children. He wants to bless the work of your hands. The, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So he's trying to steal at your health, steal your finances, steal your joy. Anything like that that's good, you want to hang on to it. No, you're not going to get my joy. I don't care what I see. I'm going to be happy in Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Amen? See, the, 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 the important thing is this, is when things happen, then you're not blaming God. You're not sitting back saying, all right, just run over me, you know? Boy, there was times in games I played against guys a lot bigger than me, you know? And, and of course, in our day, in our day, you ran an option, ran a, in football, you ran an uh, option offense in those days. Today, it's more passing and stuff, which is a lot nicer. But you ran an option offense, which means you faked, you read the defensive end, you got three options. If the fullback can get it, you can pitch the ball, or you can run the ball. Three options, three different things you can do. And the quarterback determines all those three. So as you faked, you're looking to see if that hole opened up. If it did, you give him the ball. If it didn't, you pull it in. If the defensive end comes to you, pitch the ball. If he doesn't come to you, you run it. Now, what happens when you run it? You know they're going to come and tackle you, right? So what do you do when you're running? You're not just... <laughs> no, you protect the ball, right? Protect the ball. You get ready to get hit, and you're going to move forward, right? That life... You see, life, if you know who your opponent is, then you realize, well, I might have I got hit, might have got knocked down, but I'm getting back up. Amen. Life isn't perfect. We live in a fallen world. It's not perfect. But if you know who your opponent is, it's not like you're blaming your teammate, like, what'd you knock me down for? You're not blaming your teammate. He'd slap you across the face. Hey, don't blame me. I didn't do that. That guy over there. You understand the importance of knowing who you are, understanding the importance of who you are in Christ, that you are blessed of God, but you have an opponent. You have an opponent. You have an adversary. Okay, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5 a second. Now, 1 Peter chapter 5 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, and then he identifies who it is, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, verse 9 says, resist him. You don't give in to him. In other, words, in other words, if you know you have an adversary, then you're going to resist him. If you don't know you're an opponent, you can never resist the devil. You can never resist, you can never resist someone who you don't think is even attacking you. But if you know someone's attacking you, then you can resist them. With the Word of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can resist them so you can stand in faith. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's like this. When the Bible says uh, you take the full armor of God, and then having done all, you stand. How are we standing? We stand like this? <sighs> stand like that? No, you're not standing like that. You're standing like this. So, Rana, stand up a second, Pastor Rana. So, if Rana's pushing on me, if I know I'm going to face stuff, if he's pushing on me, then I'm, then I'm braced and I'm ready to resist. But if I'm standing like this, he can push me right over. <laughs> down, down he goes for the count. You have an adversary. Now, it identifies it. This isn't, this isn't theology. This is the truth of the Bible. You sh people should be hearing this in their churches, Right? Instead of all the other cliche statements, cool, makes you feel good, everybody walks out, everything's, everything's cool. Folks, everything's not cool. People are facing adversity, lives are going to hell, it's not cool. You can't fight who you don't see, who you don't recognize. So here he identifies your adversary, your opponent is the devil. The devil. So we have to resist him in the faith. 
Knowing sufferings are happening worldwide in the brethren. Worldwide sufferings are going on. So we can teach this, of course. We have taught this. We can teach this worldwide, right? Because it's the truth of the gospel. So if I know who my opponent is, then I can stand, resist so that, what are you resisting to do? To go backwards, you know, to go forwards. Remember we said Sunday, the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. What does that mean? The devil's trying to shut the gates to, because the church is invading his territory. I've heard so many Christians, I've been prayer meetings, we're standing against the gates of hell. They're, they're like, the, like this. I said, what are you doing? You're advancing. You're resisting the enemy to advance, to go forward. Like a lineman blocking, he's not just passively blocking, he's pushing forward to gain ground. Why? Because God wants, God built us to win. What, is, what do I mean by win? Just means, means you do well in life. You're blessed in your life. We've, had, we've placed, faced many absur- uh, 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 adversities through our lives, health-wise, financial-wise, and so forth. However, it's always good to know that Jesus is on our side. It's never, what are you teaching us? Oh, I know that all through this you work out good. Never, never hocus-pocus statements. No, no, we know the Word of God. So that now in our lives, when we're in our 70s, we're still rejoicing. And you see, some people, they get old and they're just bitter and they're angry and not going to church and all that because they're blaming God. So the opponent is the devil who we resist in faith. Amen. So 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18, just a verse here that says, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But notice what the term, what he says, just write in your Bible here, Satan hindered us. And what does that mean? It means the devil threw up roadblocks, tried to, and Paul never did make it there, but tried to make roadblocks so they couldn't get there. Attacks from the enemy. See, if you know something's the will of God, then you want to stand for it. When our daughter was sick for 12 years and so forth, we knew it was the will of God, so we kept standing. Yeah, the will of God to be healed, right. Thank you. <laughs> so, eight years pass, nine years pass, we're standing. We go to the clinic praying in tongues, we'd see people praying in tongues, we'd give out gospel tracts and so forth, but standing, believing, it's his will for her to be well. Amen? That's what you want to do. Because otherwise, what do you do? You give up. And people make assumptions. Well, it must be the will of the Lord. We pray it didn't happen. It must be the will of the Lord. And they make wrong assumptions because they don't know the truth. And the devil will help people with these assumptions. That's right, Dave. It really isn't the will of the Lord. Just give it up. Just give it up. And that's what they do. They, they pass it off. And that's the rest of their life. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 13. Here's a woman that, that was sick, the Bible says, for 18 years. 18 years! 18 years! I know it's like to stand for 12. She was sick 18 years. 18 years! Long time. Notice what Jesus said. Now notice, she's in the temple. She, was, she wanted to love God and serve God. But notice it says, whom Satan hath bound. So think of it. Who bound the lady? The devil did. I'm sure in today's vernacular, well, hey, God has a reason. God's trying to teach you. God has a plan. He'll work it for good. All these things. All, you know, all this stuff can come out. <laughs> these saints, cliches, Christianese. That didn't help that lady. The devil had bound her. She had a physical affliction. 18 years, and Jesus identified it. And he healed her. Now, people were upset, actually, in the temple, but Jesus healed her and said, shouldn't, this, shouldn't she be loosed on the Sabbath day? They're kind of concerned that he did some work on the Sabbath day. Yeah, thank Jesus for the Holy Ghost. She should be loosed, and she was loosed. Remember, we shared the, the video here that one Sunday we, with Betty Baxter, and that blessed us years ago. Man, how, how she stood and believed and... and uh, I got a word from the Lord, told her mama to go buy a dress, and she did, and, and, and uh, God even told her the day she was going to get healed. 
The opponent is identified, therefore you can stand against the opponent. Now listen, even if she would die, if you know who your opponent is, you can die praising God, thank you Jesus, you're so good, he didn't give it to me. Years ago I had cancer, he didn't give me the cancer. Years ago I had a bulging disc in my back, he didn't give me the bulging disc in my back. He had surgery for that too, he didn't give me all those things. No, but he is the healer. He is the healer. That's the good news. That's the good news for all of us. You, you recognize who you are and who your opponent is so that you can stand in victory. Amen? John 10.10. 10. Okay, these are verse 10 and 11 uh, there in John 10. Jesus said that <clears throat> the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, the thief here, let's just be real clear, this isn't one of Jesus' associates. All right? This isn't one of Jesus' associates that says, oh, this guy's going to come around and steal your stuff. No, it's the devil. And Jesus is identifying he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, what does that mean? That's the fingerprints. Yeah. Did it bring death? Did it bring destruction? What does it do? It's the devil. Amen. Think of the world. Think of how the world is today and the wars and all the stuff and People try natural means to solve it, but it's not a natural solution. It's a spiritual solution. And it gets down to individually people getting born again. There will be a day of judgment, and there will be a day of reckoning, and the devil's going to be cast into the lake of fire and all that. I know that, but right now, because of Adam's sin, the enemy has been given permission to still be here in this world. And so we have to stand. And so we have to know who we are, amen, who we're standing with. So Jesus said, I've come, the good news, that you can have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Now, I believe, I believe, that, I believe the Christian should be blessed. What, what's an abundant life? I call an abundant life someone just filled with peace, someone filled with joy, someone filled with hope, someone who's happy in the Lord. That's an abundant life, right? I'm not talking about gold and silver and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about this relationship where God's going. I believe he wants to take care of us, but it's the spiritual relationship, things money can't buy, right? The world, the world would like all these things, but money can't buy those things. They're only available in Jesus Christ, love, joy, peace, and so forth. So Jesus said, I've come that they might have life, life more abundantly, because why? He says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus gave his life for you and I so that we might have his life. Amen. Amen. For any person watching, Jesus gave his life for you so that you can have his life. I tell you what, his life is good. It's a blessed life to serve the Lord, live for him, walk with him, and so on and so forth. Amen. It's just a blessed life. We put up a sign up on Main Avenue some years back, and in the policy, the policy, there was a, some policy on it and so forth that as far as what was covered on the sign, and then it said, or any other acts of God for destruction. I thought, well, see, that's the old thinking. Those, those things used to be in insurance policies all the time. In other words, I'm going to cover for this or this, but anything we can't even explain is an act of God. Destruction. No, no, it's not an act of God. That was for our sign out there, the insurance on it and so forth. Those, those things were really common. The acts of the devil is to steal, kill, and destroy. The acts of the devil is destruction, car wrecks, financial loss, cancer, the fingerprints. Be smart enough to say, well, what are the fingerprints? You can ask someone. When, next time someone says, you know, well, this is something bad happened. I got all things under control. Say, just uh, say, uh, really, what, what's the fingerprints on that? Got all things in control. What's the fingerprints? Most people look at you cross eyed like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. I just say he's wearing the wrong jersey. Not the right person. So we have acts of the devil and we have acts of God. And the acts of God is that he would bring life and life more abundantly. The acts of God that would just uh, bring protection and bring good health and bring spiritual and physical blessings. Those are the acts of God. And that's what we want to believe for. Amen? Amen. Don't give up. 
Don't give up what you have to your opponent. Know who you're facing so that you can overcome. Now, 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God. You belong to him. You've already defeated in the spirit realm, defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater and mightier than he who is in the world. Well, that is the devil, right? So, so God has given you this victory and me this victory, and I want to hold on to it. And I've experienced a lot of good things, but you know what? I want to experience more, you know? We're, we're in our 70s, but I think, hey, there's so much good out there. I feel like sometimes we're just scratching the surface on the goodness of God. But that's what we export. Wherever we go, be it here, uh, at the tabernacle, or we go any place in the world, we're exporting good news. We're exporting things. People come up for prayer with all kinds of stuff. Because why? They're looking for answers. Amen. It's amazing what God does. But we're saying things that can set people free free so that they can live in the victory. Romans 8, the Bible just says that, that God, if God be for us, who can be against us? And he is for us. He is on your side. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. So you have power. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have power. <laughs> all right. You have power. Power. I give you authority, power to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Amen. The word victory implies that there was a battle. The word victory implies that there was some sort of battle, the outcome meaning victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Every day I get up and I just want, thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm thanking him for the victory over the enemy. Hallelujah. Amen. For his goodness and grace. And then let me just read this. Psalm 23, verse 6. You should turn your Bible there in that. Psalm 23, verse 6. Just says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me most of the days of my life. Oh, I misread that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're in Christ. So we would say, All the days of my life. What's following me? What's following us? What should follow you? It should be goodness and mercy. So we're walking by faith. And behind us is goodness and mercy. Let me tell you, he wants to bless you. He wants to bless your home. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your children. You might see things that aren't what you think they should be yet. Tell you what, keep praying. Keep believing. Keep confessing the word of God. Keep standing on the truth against the liar. And I believe, you know, no matter how, how long it takes, but I believe you're going to see the victory. You're going to see the victory. Don't give up. It could be 12 years for us. It was 18 years for this lady in the temple, bound by the enemy. But you're going to see the victory, and you're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Amen? Amen. You know, so, so all this life, people say, well, then, then someday you're going to die. And I said, the truth is, yeah, all of us are going to die. And when that day comes, well, we died, we're going to have a celebration, right? You get to go to heaven, thank you, Jesus. But in the meantime, we're going to live here in the victory that God has given us. The Bible says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Hallelujah. I love knowing that he loves me. I do know my opponent is, but that's not what I magnify. I magnify that fact that he loves me. And you know what? He's already given me the victory. So it's like going, it's like going on the field knowing, hey, I look at the scoreboard. We already won. Well, I got to play the game, but we already won. But I just got to be a participant. I just got to do my part in this game of life. But we've already won. Amen? Amen. You, can't, you can't just roll over, play dead or whatever, or sit in the locker room. No, no, get out in the field. <laughs> got to keep pushing yourself because you've won in Jesus. We bless everybody watching here tonight in Jesus' name. And you might be watching from nearby, far away, but we just bless you in the name of Jesus. The Lord is the same everywhere worldwide. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He loves you with an everlasting life. He delivered us from wrath and brought us his wonderful life. Thank you, Lord. So we bless you in Jesus' name. We bless the people here. We bless the tabernacle, even as we prayed today. God is working and doing things. So Lord, we thank you for your great goodness and grace, and that goodness and mercy is following us. Hallelujah. Thank you for blessing people, giving us wisdom to know the battles we're in.
that we can walk by faith and see great things happen in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can share this with somebody. Share it with somebody else. Amen. And encourage them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for tuning in.